Hey, I wanted to share that testimony with you as one of many um, that are available, one of many that are out there, one of many that are within our church, within our lives, of how God moves when we lean into Him. Again, it's very typical testimony as far as, and all of us have testimonies, of the time when something's not right, when we're lost, we're in darkness, we're, uh, maybe even seems like the world's going okay, and, but there's still just something that's not quite there, or maybe you've seen something else more. And then when we turn it over to Jesus, or we lean into Jesus, and He comes in, all of a sudden there's a difference, all of a sudden there's a change. And that's a testimony. From beginning to end, sometimes that's the first time you come to know Jesus as leader and forgiver in your life. When you acknowledge with your mouth, He's the Son of God. When you believe in your heart, you died and rose again and say, hey, look, I want to follow you. And He comes in, and you see the kind of change like we see in this young man's life as we follow Him and lean into Him. Uh, it could be that you've been following the Lord for years, and things get tough, and you have to go through a really hard season, and you feel disconnected, or those type of things are going on. And you lean into the Lord, and you trust His promises, and then just something clicks. You know, sometimes he has us wait those 10 days or two weeks, or depending on what Bible story I'm kind of mysteriously referencing all of a sudden. But after a season, he shows up and everything changes. That's a, a testimony. And the things that's awesome about testimonies, like in this young man, is it changes everything in your life. It changes everything in your life. But beyond that, the other thing that's awesome is it's now a tool, it's a reference, it's a story, it's something that you know is real, that you get to share with others to help them when they're in their dark places or when they're in their black places or they're going through their midnight season when things aren't going well. It's, it's something that we have to move forward on. And that's one of the things that made me excited about his testimony was that he was able to go back into a place that used to be so overwhelming and not do anything overly crazy. You know what I mean? Like uh, the, the, some guys say, here, I'll give you 100 pounds of chickens. Oh, what can I do for the Lord with that? I mean, a lot of times we don't think those kind of thoughts, but it's amazing the resources we sometimes have that we can do things that don't cost money or don't necessarily mean I have to create some kind of big church or that kind of thing going on. But I can go back and love on people. I can go back and serve people. I can let my life be a life that's on mission, that makes a difference, that, makes it, you know, that helps people in their challenges as well as my own. And it's been kind of interesting. When we were down at the SEND conference a couple of weeks ago, Gary and I, they had several testimonies there from people who have experienced the same type of thing in their life. That's one of the things I, I did like about this conference. I admitted earlier I'm critical of all things, but what I did like about this conference is it wasn't just everybody who was on stage speaking or everybody leading a small group that said at the end, now come buy my book, now come buy my DVDs. It wasn't just the big names. It was people who, yeah, were church planners that no one's ever heard of before. And this is how God changed my life, so this is how I'm trying to serve others. Uh, there were people that used sports as part of their, their ministry. And I'm not talking like, again, NBA guys or NFL guys. I'm talking, hey, I grew up in Detroit, and I used to play ball in high school. And when I came to the Lord, I was able to go back into the streets and play ball with guys. And this is what God's doing with that ministry. I'm talking about a housewife that no one's heard of outside of her neighborhood who just said to a couple of her girlfriends, hey, what do you guys think about just inviting our kids' friends together and just having a Bible study at my house once a week? that now leads a group of 35, 40 middle school boys in study and learning about the Lord. And uh, there's been over 20, I know, of kids who have come to the Lord and are being discipled through the program. We all have opportunities to not just take the, from the Lord, but to be able to invest it back out. And I thought, man, that's just something we need to dig into. As we're, again, looking at, last week we kind of started this introduction, reminding ourselves yet again, you guys probably get tired of hearing this here, but we have a job. If we accept Jesus' lead and forgive in our lives, we're to lead others to the Lord, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and disciple each other so we can grow to be more like Christ. We're on, we're on that bit. That's the number one thing above any retirement plan that I have or anything as far as a vacation with my family or working up the ranks at my job. That's the number one thing. And I thought, man, just to be reminded of that in some testimonies, we need that. Then we have like this... this like opportunity per se, not that it's necessarily different than any other week, but as we come up to back, uh, back to church weekend here in a couple of weeks, um, which again is, is kind of a national program that, that we plug into. We don't plug into a lot of national programs. I actually caught Chris off guard <laughs> last night. She walked to my office and there's a box that's back to church weekend. Like you can buy these packages for like 60 bucks. And, they, and like we ignore most of it. We like use the videos 
and a couple of things for Facebook. But like, I don't like to do the, the sermons or whatnot like that. And that, that's fine. Other people do. It's just not all way. Um, but she looked at it. She goes, I thought we didn't do those kind of boxes in this church. Yeah, we don't. We just got the CD out of it. You know, we'll do that. It's not a programming thing for us, but we do have a heart. And it, it really is with the start of our church to reach out to people who have been hurt by church before, who hurt by Christians before. So back to church really kind of focuses in on us. So it's kind of high, to give an opportunity for you guys for relational evangelism to invite people. Uh, you know, we just had all the baptisms, and we have testimonies that we hear and whatnot that, that we would keep to, to ourselves to just be horrendous instead of reaching out to others. So maybe invite somebody at our church, invite somebody to somebody else's church, take invite them to lunch, talk to them about Jesus. Just a great opportunity. So all this stuff's going on. It's like, man, so much passion in that. You know, so much opportunity with that. And we'll talk about some of those details later on, but I just really want to talk about the Spirit and what, what stops us from that. Because as I talk to most of us, we feel challenged, I think, sometimes when it comes to reaching out to somebody for Jesus or reach into the dark spot that they're in and just love on them or to say, oh, 100 pounds of chicken. I don't know what I'd do with that. You might want to send that to a food pantry and put on somebody else. What, what are those things that stop us from moving in these directions? You know, we talk about this stuff all the time. And I see some people living life on mission and others of us are just doing the same old thing with the maybe you know, a little bit of a step here and there. How do we move forward past that? So I was thinking about that. There's a lot of reasons, I'm sure. All of us have probably have different reasons that we've come up against. But there were three that kind of stood out to me that I wanted to dig into today. Uh, one, I think fear comes into it sometimes. You know, I, I talk to people that are like, well, what if they ask a question that I don't know the answer to? Or what if they reject me? Or I tried that before and they just shut me down, or I've been trying with this person for two years, and I just kind of gave up. You know, fear could definitely be a part of it. I think part of it, too, is just um, maybe just, I don't know the best way to phrase it, culture, that we get sucked back into just living like the rest of the world, and we get so used to going through the job and doing the yard work and that kind of stuff that we kind of lose that, that focus, and things just kind of get a little lukewarm. Um, and the third one I, I thought about and I was talking to somebody this morning about this, and I, I just love how the Spirit works, is sometimes we fall into these patterns where we think our Christian walk is just about our Christian walk, and we're trying to do all the right things, and we're trying to have the right teachings, and we go to home group, and we go to church, and we take and read the Bible, and we got our devotional, and all these things are in place, and we're holding true to it, but we just have kind of lost the passion. We've lost the intimacy. we lost the relationship. And so I want to dig into all three of those a little bit today and see what the Bible tells us about that, what the Word of God has, actually the words of Christ has on that, and then give us a chance to be able to respond. And uh, the response time is going to be a little crazy, crazy, so let's see how you guys do with this. So let's do this. Let's get into Scripture. Let's go to Revelation, if you would. We're going to go start out in Revelation chapter 2. Again, you have your Bibles if you brought them with you, if you got your version up and running, if you want to use your tablet or your phone. Uh, that's just a, an app that people use, and they hit live events, find ours, and then the scriptures are there, and there's note-taking and that kind of stuff for those that are techies. And if you do not have a Bible, there's always Bibles in the baskets around you. Uh, if you do not see a basket in the row in front of you, it's in the right underneath your bottom. So just feel free to borrow one of our Bibles, or if you do not have a Bible, feel free to take it home with you. We don't mind at all. We like to restock those things as much as possible. But we're going to go to three letters... And if you saw this on Facebook, it talked about, you know, why Jesus wrote you a letter on some of the things we struggle with. This is kind of what this is. There's seven letters in Revelation, the seven distinct churches that were around when John had this vision, when John was on the island of Patmos, and God was showing him all these great things. And I know Revelation, for some people, can be a little bit, woo, out there, a little scary, you know. Like, I grew up in the this, this, this 70s. And, you know, we had, like, all these, like, scary <laughs> movies. I mean, if you guys are my age, you know what I'm talking about, right? Like, it's like, hey, it's church night. Let's go watch a movie on Revelation. You're like, ah, you know, with the, with the false prophet and the beast and all this stuff going on. Um, Revelation has that in it. If you don't know Jesus as leader and forgiver in your life, it's a scary book. The end of days is not good. If you have Jesus as leader and forgiver in your life and you have eternal security, I'm telling you, there's some beauty in Revelation. Not that everybody else is born in and you're not, but there's so much worship in it. There's so much that we have to look forward to being in the presence of our King and the angels and the multitudes. 
Uh, and, and there should be encouragement within it. That when we do see the scary stuff, I don't want my brother going through that. I don't want my friend at work to go through that. It should be motivating as well. But this particular section with these seven letters, I, I, I'm drawn to often. Um, one of these letters uh, really spurred on us opening the Christian bookstore back in those days. Uh, really, uh, for Jenny and I, is a, is a personal letter because of that testimony, which in turn spurred on this church. Um, but it's also interesting for all of us because, okay, you got the seven letters to the seven churches at that time. There are things in each one of them that we can learn from and that the Spirit can speak to us through. And this is when it gets a little wacky. When you get into kind of the prophecy aspect of things, uh, and I, I won't bore you with it too long, but I find this really cool. When you look at the seven churches in the order that they're in, and you look at the things that they're dealing with, um, Jesus reaching out to them because they're letting false teaching, and, and, they're, and they're taking and accepting false teaching, uh, even though they know it's false. Uh, letting in sin and not, not addressing sin. All the different things that are there, and you look at the church age from the time that Jesus ascended into heaven to the time that he's coming back, and he is coming back, amen. In between those two is the church age. And when you look at the things that we as the church have gone through in those 2,000 years, these letters play out in order of the things that we deal with. And the thing that's exciting about that is the last letter, the church of Lady Asia, which we will get into today, and is the letter that spurred us on that we talked about, is the church age today. So even though I'm not going to overly address into it, think about that when we get to this, the second letter we're going to look at, what Jesus is speaking to the church today as well. But for today, we're just going to focus in on the lens of those three fears and what can be done into it. What would Jesus speak into it? So again, th this, is, this is awesome. These are the words of Christ. They're usually broken into three different sections. Sometimes they have a little bit more, and there's so much beauty in them that it's just crazy. But So let's, let's get into it and see what happens. So starting in Revelation chapter 2, verse 8. Oh, man, if you had a smart pastor, he would study how you pronounce things. Smona? You guys want to call it Smona? Sure. To the angel of the church in Smona write, the words of the first and the last, who died and came to life. So as he's writing to this church in this city that's about 200,000 people, so about four times the size of Miriam, that at one point was kind of weak, kind of had a lot of struggles going on, uh, but early on when Rome started conquering the world, they didn't wait. They like jumped in and said, hey, Rome, have us. And they just jumped on board because they saw kind of what was to come. And Rome honored that by taking care of this city and, and leaning into the city and putting resources into the city. So the city had been built up, but to be a Christian there was not necessarily the most comfortable environment. And there were threats of persecution and there were threats of being arrested. There were threats of losing family and friends because of your walk with the Lord. And so Jesus starts talking to them. Again, these are the words of Christ being dictated to the angel of this church that is overseeing this church. And he says, let's start with who's writing it. Just like Paul would always start, you know, I, I the apostle Paul, blah, 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 or I, Peter. He's starting out with who this is. And the things that he says are incredible when you study these letters. Think about it. They're about to talk about persecution and fear. And he says, these are the words of the first and the last, because that's who I am. I'm the first and the last, and I died and came to life. In other words, I know that you guys are afraid. If we're going to talk about fear when it comes to reaching out to others and teaching others and serving others, I know you're afraid. But understand, the person who's about to speak to you the, through this word, I was at the beginning, I'm at the end, I'm the beginning and the end, everything in between there, nothing's scary to me, nothing's new to me, I, beginning to end. And if you're worried about losing things or losing relationships or losing status or losing money or whatever the case may be, understand this. The biggest thing you're going to face is death. I kicked its butt. That's, who, that's who's speaking to you right now. I'm the, from the first to the last. I conquered death. Can you listen to me for a few seconds as I minister to you when it comes to your fear? Then he says this. I know your tribulation. And I know your poverty, but you're rich. And I love that because they're looking at the wrong things to gauge their poverty and their, their wealth. I know your poverty in the world, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. In this particular area, there were people who were claiming to be Jews that were not, claiming to be God's people and were not. They set up a false synagogue. He goes, I'm aware. I see it. Everything in your life, everything in your city, we're on the same page. 
Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have tribulation. But be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. In some ways, this is a very humbling scripture because the things that I get afraid about as far as reaching others or serving others seem so minor compared to this. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes it's it's so minor. I'm not in fear of being arrested in this country. I'm not in fear of them coming into this place and busting us out for worshiping God. We are very blessed. If you follow my Facebook page, you see a couple times a week, three times, four times, Different stories of brothers and sisters in Christ that need prayer, need us signing petitions, need us being a voice because they're in countries where they are being threatened with death because they follow Christ. I don't have that. I'm nervous about going down the hall and talking to somebody in another cubicle. I'm nervous that, oh, my, if I follow God, do I have to trust him with my money and my time? I'm nervous that maybe my neighbor might take and call me that crazy nuthead because I go to church and we have a Bible study and I invite him to it. But at the same time, if we're really honest, it does feel that scary, though. Isn't that crazy? We get so used to our circumstances and so used to our well norm that it can feel that scary. And so I don't want to beat you up on that. I've been there. And Jesus steps into it and says, I'm the first. I'm the last. I've conquered death. I've conquered that. Lean into me and follow me. And he's not about selling a false dream. He says to us, hey, look, some of you are going to prison. Some of you are going to suffer. Some of you guys are going to have family members that talk about you. Some of you are going to have friends. And some of you guys have testimonies of friends who walked away from you because they wanted nothing to do with somebody who's going to go to the church. Nothing to do with that because they got their own hurt and pain and they need to see a new example. But right now they want nothing to do with you. Some of us are going to sacrifice Nothing bigger than the first and the last and the death and the resurrection. But some of us have to push through fear. And he says, it's okay. Satan is going to come against you. But if you overcome, I have the crown of life right here. The last part there in verse 11 is this. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I love that line. In other words, if you will listen, listen to what I'm going to say. In other words, I know some of you are going to ignore this. But you as an ear and will let this penetrate in, the one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. I get to go home someday. I get to see my Savior face to face. I get to worship with the multitudes of angels. I need to take some of my focus off of my own fear and put my trust in the Lord and follow him. Does that make sense? If we would just go to chapter 3. And I invite you to go through all these letters. Oh, man, they're just so awesome. In chapter 3, verse 14, we find some things when it comes to just kind of getting sucked into the norm of the culture and the old way of thinking, the old way of living, the old goals, the old stress. When he cho- talks to the church of Lady Asia. Now, Lady Asia, this is the letter I was talking about, that this is our part of the church age. If you look at it honestly from that aspect, you're going to say, yep, yep, I see that in the church. And I look at the national church, at least just the national church. I see that going on. But I think a lot of us are going to say we can see it in our own lives too if we're bold enough to look at it. Lady C was a really cool town, uh, pretty wealthy town, had a lot going on. Uh, probably so much I'll forget to tell you all of it. Uh, they had uh, a waterway or like a, a, a tunneling system that carried water from five miles away where they had these hot springs uh, with just really pure water. And it went out to all these different towns. And it was right through the middle of the town, like five miles out. The problem was when it went through their town, because it traveled five miles, it wasn't hot anymore. You know, you couldn't boil things with it or sterilize things with it or anything of that nature. Uh, And and it it wasn't cold. You know, you had to to make it hot again or make it cold again because that's further down after it loses more of its heat where you can actually find it refreshing, that type of thing. It's just this lukewarm water. And like everybody in the city is tired of lukewarm water. You know, like if all that you and I had was Mountain Dew, how many Mountain Dew fans do we like have? Okay? This might be an exception for a couple of you guys that are just completely addicted. 
But for most of us, that's all we had. Sooner or later, it gets to be a little old. And that's what it was kind of with this lukewarm water. But they still, again, they had a lot of industry there. They had a, a great clothing manufacturing uh, thing going on that was bringing a lot of money into the, to the community. It was mostly black wool. was kind of like what they were known for, what they grew there, what they manufactured there. Uh, they had a medical school there, which was very unique during that time. And there was actually a famous doctor that practiced and taught there at that time. So they were known for that. They were known for uh, this, this uh, stuff that I, I don't know the name. It was real science sounding. And you know me, I don't care if I sound smart or not. Um, but uh, it's stuff that they would make like eye medicine out of. Like if you have a problem with your eyes or whatnot, that you put this like soft like stuff on your eyes and, and uh, it would make it better. You know, it just had these medical qualities to it. And the reason I tell you all this is not because I'm boring you with a bunch of history stuff and I'm some kind of big geek or whatever. Um, it's because Jesus references all that. Again, just the second time of just saying, I'm aware I'm watching. I'm involved. I love you. I know what's going on in your life, and I know what's going on in community, and I love that. So he starts talking to them about kind of getting stuck into that culture and getting comfortable and losing their zeal by starting on verse 14 saying uh, to, to the angel of the church and lady, see, the, the, write this. These are the words of the amen. These are the words of the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of God's creation. So if we start looking at just kind of getting kind of, you know, just blah in our Christian walk hear who's talking to us today I'm the amen in other words so shall it be the one who's talking to you today this is the way it is this is so shall it be talking to you I'm the true and faithful witness which if I'm really honest blows me away a little bit and humbles me because I'm not necessarily always all that true I'm not always as faithful as Jesus Christ I'm not always at that place where, where I, I, I'm there. A friend of mine uh, was calling it a sometimes Christian. Jesus is. These are the words of the amen. So shall it be. I'm the true witness. I'm the faithful witness. I'm the one that's been through all of creation. All creation is through me. I was there, the whole thing. I understand all this. I've got all the power. I've got all the authority. And I want to say to you, I know your works. Verse 15. You are neither cold nor hot. I would rather that you be either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. I understand he's talking to the church. He's talking to Christians, right? He's talking to the church. I would rather you be cold, at least you'd be useful for something, hot, you're useful for something. You know how nasty that water is every day? That's how nasty it is to me when you take and say, I love you, Lord. I'm following you, Lord. And then you go back and act like the world 24-7. About to spit you out of my mouth. For I say to you, oh no, for you say, I am rich. I've prospered. I need nothing. I've got everything in place. I, everything's going according to goal. But you don't realize that you're wretched, pitiable, pit, I always say it wrong, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourselves in the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and solve to anoint your eyes so that you may see those whom I love, I repro reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. I'm not going to make you do it, but I think if we look at it honestly, a lot of us would raise our hands if we say we'll put it on Luke Rome when it comes to our walk with Jesus Christ. I would bet that a lot of us would raise our hands and say I'm Luke Rome when it comes to doing the works that he says he's aware of and reaching out to others and serving others and loving on others. And Jesus is very clear how he feels about that. He does not in any way, shape, or form say, I know how hard it is. I know you're busy at work right now. I know what your goal is, is to have the house and the boat and the car and be able to go out in the most. I, I know you'll get there sometime. You'll have the time. I know the kids keep you busy, so you don't really have time to teach them or pray with them. You're just trying to get through the day without killing them. I understand. <laughs> he doesn't say that. Because I'm aware of your works. And I'm aware of what's happened in your life, that you've gotten grace and mercy and that you've gotten the truth. And I'm aware that you have a job and I'm aware you're not doing it. And it disgusts me. Anybody wish we'd go back to the one fuzzy Jesus that just sit there and holding kids on their laps? And it disgusts me. Because there's so many people in need. And there's so much more purpose in your life than adopting what the world has fed you up on a silver platter. 
And if you hear this, understand what I'm saying. I love you. That's why I'm reaching out to you. If I didn't love you, I'd ignore you and jump on to somebody else who seems to be a little bit more passionate. But I love you. I reach out to you. I make you feel uncomfortable in this moment. And I ask you, will you just repent? Will you just move forward? 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, the one who takes and hears this message, understands his love and re- leans into it, the one who conquers, I'll grant him to sit with me on my throne. I will grant them to sit with me on my throne because also, I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. In other words, I've been there and I conquered it and I'm in my glory. You can lean into this. You can conquer this. You can be with me in glory. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. When I grew up, uh, I grew up American Baptist. And uh, don't hold that against me. I love American Baptist. I love going home. Uh, and, and it was a very traditional church. Again, I love tradition as long as it doesn't uh, become more weighty than the Holy Spirit. Tradition has a great place within the church. And uh, this traditional church, again, it's more pews and uh, suits and everything. I think I, when I was, I remember when I was about yay high, I had a red suit, and I looked good. <laughs> Mom bought me that suit. We wear that every week, church. That red suit, and every week there was this picture right up over here that had Jesus standing that door knocking. Have you guys seen that picture? Beautiful picture, beautiful picture, and you know, famous story with it. There's no knob on the outside, and that's because Je- you can only open it from the inside. And we were told the church many times. If you don't know Jesus, if you're not a Christian, he's right there knocking on that door. All you got to do is open that door and he'll come in. You know, in one way that's true. Absolutely. If you don't know Jesus today, you lean into him, all changes. Grace, mercy, Holy Spirit, love it. Love it. Love to be part of your life with that. But that's not what Jesus is saying here. He's not saying if you don't know me, I'm knocking at the door. He says, church, you know me. And you're sitting inside doing nothing, and I'm at the door knocking. And if you, Christian, will open that door, I'm ready to come in and have dinner with you. I'm ready to jam with you. I'm ready to go forward and change your world and the worlds around you if you open the door. We've got to get past the culture. Next one. Going back to Revelation 2. The one I was talking about just kind of trying to be the good Christian, trying to make it all go good, trying to get everything off the checklist. This is us. This is Ephesus. Verse 1, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, and who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Okay, a little bit of context here. One, Ephesus is a church that Paul loved. If you go back to Acts, if you go to the church of uh, the the, the book of uh, the Ephesians, to the church of Ephesus, Paul started this church. He put the leaders in place. He loved it dearly as he continued to move uh, forward, and God was leading him away from there, and he had the Holy Spirit put on his heart. You're leaving and never coming back. We have a story where he's talking to the elders about that, and they're weeping and hugging each other because they love each other so much. I mean, this is a great church. And so as Paul started it, they're very big on theology, and they know what's right, and they know what's wrong, and they don't put up with anything in between the two. They love God, and they're moving forward, but there's still a problem. And when Jesus says, I'm the one who holds the seven stars in my right hand, and I'm the one who walks among the seven lampposts, we we have to go into the kind of prophecy end of things and some of the stuff earlier in chapter 1. The seven stars, roll with me on this, again, study us deeper, are the seven angels that he's talking to. The seven lampstands are the churches that he's talking to. In other words, I who hold all the power in the 30th church and walk amongst the church and see what's going on in the church and, I'm, and my power and authority are, is with the church. I, who am very, very real, have something to say to you. And he says to them, I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance, uh, and, and how you cannot bear those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and you found them to be false. I know that you're enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and that you have not grown weary. I see that you guys are nailing it. You're in the woods, you're in home groups, everything's going great, but I have this against you. You abandoned the love 
you had at first. You've lost the passion. You lost the zeal. You lost the intimacy of why I died and rose again so I can have that with you. You stopped loving each other. You stopped loving me. You're just going through the motions now for all the right reasons, but without the right emotion. I see this in ministry a lot. Pastors, worship leaders, youth leaders, people that that start the ministry and they're like, if I could, God would just use me as a, a youth leader. And they become youth leaders. And two years later, it's like, oh man, I just need some time to myself. And I'm so tired of people calling me all the time and these kids wanting stuff. You want to strangle somebody, you want to quit, you just want to pull away. God, if you would just let me play music for you. A couple years later, ah, I hated how that practice went. I want to strangle the worship leader who never does things the way I want him to. Pastors who hate ministry. But if we're really honest, all of us as Christians go through this as well. I'm doing all the right stuff. I just have lost that passion. Jesus says in verse 5, Remember, therefore, from where you've fallen, Remember your first love and realize where you're at now is so far away from it. And repent. And then go back and do the works that you did at first. Because if you don't, I'll come to you and I'll remove your lampstone from its place unless you repent. Verse 7, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in paradise of God. If you lost the passion, if you lost that love, if you're just doing it because grandma put this stuff inside you, if you're just doing this because this is the way you were raised, remember what it was like when you first came to Jesus and you saw the mercy and grace and say, man, I've fallen so far away from that. It's just something that I do. Repent. And get excited again. The Bible is not silent on fear, on our culture, on our dead heart. And he's not silent about what we are to do about it. If I put some of these things together, I just kind of write down some notes. It seems that he's calling us to remember Remember what it's like to come to Jesus. Remember what he's given us. Remember the grace that we are stewards of. To repent in the areas that we're struggling. To answer that door, man. Answer that door. And then get to work. Verse 